Um, so you need to know basically the terminology and the use of hardware, software applications, functions, input, output devices, networks, and basic design principles. So just like the basic stuff, that, that's it, very basic. Understand issues related to safe and appropriate use of technology in society and follow guidelines for the legal and ethical use of technology and digital information. Um, so that's privacy guidelines, copyright laws, acceptable use policies and digital etiquette. So um, you definitely wanna teach your kids about um, you know, being responsible online before you give them the, the ability to be online in your classroom. Not, I'm not talking about their phones. They shouldn't have their phones out, but hey, I'm talking about the computer, right? So educating them before they're able to get on the computer and start doing things. Um, apply procedures for acquiring, analyzing, and evaluating electronic information. So locating information on networks, assessing and manipulating information from secondary storage and remote devices, using online help and other documentation and evaluating electronic information for accuracy and validity. So once again, um, showing your students how to find the correct information, right? Um, ways that, you know, teaching them how um, to know if a website is valid, right? Uh, are they able to find a date? Is the, the author's name on the, um, on the article? Things of that nature. Is the information credible? Can they go to more than one website and find the same information? Those are the things that you tell your kids, and they're definitely going to make it in the form of a question with answer choices, right? So you want to make sure that students know if information is accurate and valid. Um, D, know how to use task appropriate tools and procedures to synthesize knowledge, create and modify solutions and evaluate results to support the work of individual and groups in problem solving situations and project based learning activities. So, okay, in this competency, they do project based activities, right? So, planning, creating, editing, word processing documents, spreadsheets, databases, using graphic tools. So, They'll probably be talking about PowerPoints in here, participating in electronic communities as learners, initiator, and contributors, and sharing information through online communication. You also know how to use productivity tools to collaborate and communicate, right? So those buzzwords, collaborate, communicate information, right? You wanna look for those buzzwords when you are looking at your answer choices, right? So, when they are talking about various formats, look at the slideshow, multimedia presentations, newsletters, that's what they're talking about, and applies procedures for publishing information in various ways. What are those various ways? Printed copy, monitor display, internet document, and video. All this information that's just in looking at the competency knows how to plan, organize, deliver, and evaluate instruction that incorporates the effective use of, of current technology. You know how to use developmentally appropriate instructional practices, activities, and materials to integrate technology application sheets into the curriculum. So what, um, a, what incorporating technology for an early elementary classroom might look like might be different from how you would incorporate it in a high school, right? Going back to competency two, with the not competency two, competency one, developmentally appropriate activities, right? G, you know how to promote creative thinking and innovative process to construct knowledge, generate new ideas, and create products. So, what does it mean to create products? Design multimedia presentations, explore complex systems or issues, and develop steps for the creation of products. And then you identify and address equity issues related to the use of technology. What does that look like? So you know, as most of your kids or half of your kids don't have technology, right? Then you would make the technology lab accessible for everyone, right? So you might, and there's actually a question like that on one of the practice tests. Um, and it asks you, you know, like, if half of your students don't have computers or uh, laptops, do you pull out half of your kids and have them go to the lab? Do you uh, readjust your timeline so everybody can go to the lab? 
and you would absolutely readjust. You wouldn't call out kids who didn't have technology, right? Because that's, yes. <laughs> that might embarrass somebody. So those are the type of questions that do pop up. All right. So um, we did our competency breakdown, going through it, you know, um, letter by letter. So what are some key concepts that you got from competency now? What are, what are some vocabulary terms or some concepts you know you need to know in order to be successful in competency? You can go ahead and just type it in the chat. Yep, technology. That's, that's a big one. Database. Spreadsheets. Okay. Ethical use of technology. Absolutely. Productivity tools. What else? Copyright. Yep, because we got to know that. Uh, fair use. Collaborate in communication. Absolutely. Decision making, yep. Equity, nice, nice work. There we have it. Okay, so that is our competency breakdown. We're gonna keep it moving. All right, so my analysis, um, instructional materials and resources. Um, is, this competency is going to talk about computers, video, AV, manipulative, um, planning for resources, understanding that technology should not be your entire lesson, right? It should supplement your lesson. Um, it, you know, it should work in conjunction with your lesson. Uh, print resources, journals, computer software, the internet. Um, these are terms that stood out to me. All right, so uh, knowing the effective teacher includes a wide variety of learning resources, um, the teacher needs to have an idea of the classroom library so they can search and find text referring to what he or she is learning. The teacher should also have a list of audiovisual tools, movies, videos, music, and computer programs to make teaching easier, right? Um, the effective teacher determines the right place for children to work with computers or audiovisual equipment. For example, a video on Corral can be used as an introduction to the lesson, right? So that's where that technology can come in. The same video can be viewed again to see if students recognize the animals and plants studied in the lesson. The videos can be used after a discussion uh, or a class and can be stopped while watching to ask questions and promote prediction and high level knowledge. So this is how technology should be incorporated in your class. So print resources. I'm a teacher at heart. So what I do, I paraphrase and move on. Uh, but you're more than welcome to read along. So uh, with print resources, that's just saying, you know, books are common resources uh, for print, magazines, um, newspapers, they're all great sources of information as well, especially within the classroom, right? And books bring very relevant information, especially with research uh, papers. Visual materials, all right? So knowing you might use blackboards in your class, projectors, um, teachers need to make sure that they are writing clearly and without error so students are able to read it. It doesn't need to be too small or too blurred so that students get the message uh, properly. You also wanna make sure that you don't have too many graphics where students are not understanding the message and they're paying more attention to like the pretty graphics instead of the message, right? All right, so video disc and interactive video. Um, so the most important advantage of video discs is that they can store more information. So video, music, sounds that can be accessed faster. They work like a DVD. At present, it is unlikely if they do not have these resources. So many of these programs come interactive for computers, so you can plan individual or group use of a lesson using these softwares. All right. Computer software tools. So um, as teachers, we use a various amount of computer software that can be extremely beneficial to teachers and students. 
So you have uh, products that have grammar correction, but you want to be careful with grammar correction, spelling correction, because you don't want to take away, and this is also going to be a question, right? Um, you don't want to take away the child's ability to be able to auto-correct themselves and edit correct themselves. But if you have like a copy and paste, that's good um, because if you're showing kids how to revise, revising in the writing process is copying and pasting. So you can take away a sentence, you can add a sentence, but you want to stay away from software where kids are not able to edit on their own. When we're talking about computer software tools, we're also talking about spreadsheets like Excel um, and also PowerPoint, right? We're familiar with that. Keeping in mind, so design issues, right? So when creating a presentation, it's important to have some considerations. Um, you want to try to avoid sounds that can distract the audience. You want the presentation to be consistent, have the same background, format. These are the things that you're teaching your students, right? The audience needs to be able to read the presentation, right? Um, and that's that. Move on. Computer assisted instruction. So um, computer assisted construction, basically these programs are simulators that allow students to predict the future based on real events from the present and the past. These software allow the child to visualize his or her thoughts and see the results according to the decisions that the students introduce to the program, right? They're typically expensive, but um, are definitely helpful when we're talking about data. Um, so manipulatives and labs. So we see a lot of manipulatives. And I know you're talking about, I know you're thinking, well, okay, this is a competency that's about technology. Well, they threw manipulatives in there as well, so. That's where we are. So with manipulatives, we see that a lot with math when they're explaining geometric or place value, fractions, decimals, and even with like science. Science labs are full of manipulatives, right? So that definitely helps students be able to retain knowledge. So when we're talking about the internet, we know the internet has a lot of information, right? And because there's so much information, sometimes it's hard to find the valid information that allows students to fully be able to learn. That's our job as teachers, to teach students what is valid on the internet, what is accurate, right? So you wanna make sure that students are not just copying and pasting because that's called plagiarism. You wanna teach them how to find good information and have a good understanding about that information and be able to search for it. Uh, record it and arrange it. So then we also have the children's internet protection. So for the use of the internet, it is important that the teacher know the Children's Internet Protection Act and the Neighborhood Children's Internet Protection Act, which were two laws that were established in the year 2000 for the protection of children against immoral information that may affect development, right? Um, so for them, schools must have technological blockers. So a lot of times when you go to um, school, they, they have you on block. You can't get on YouTube and all this stuff. The, the kids can't get on a lot of things. And that's under the Child's Internet Protection Act. You may or may not get a question on that. It, you know, you get different versions, but you just want to make sure you know whatever you need to know up under the competency. So technology and copyright issues. So copyright is a protection provided by the United States to guarantee the authorship of literary works, writings, poems, songs, and artistic works. It is illegal for someone to violate these rights and, can be pen and they can be penalized. But there is a limitation, guys. So if you are a teacher under Section 107 through 121 of the Copyright Act of 1976, you are exempt from that penalty. Does that mean you need to take the entire book of poems, the entire collection of works? No, you probably can still be sued. You, you want to have make sure you have enough sense to use just um, just the right amount of, you know, that poem or just the right amount of that diagram and collective work specifically for your lesson, right? So as teachers, we can copy parts of a book, of a poem, graphics, collective work, diagrams, videos, photos, things of that nature, right? Um, and of course, the effective teacher only takes part of those jobs and limits themselves to only information of the work that they really need. 
All right, so let's see. So selection and evaluation. So the effective teacher must have the ability to evaluate the, re the resources he or she is using and whether those resources are oriented or similar to the curriculum being taught. So you remember what I was saying? that technology needs to supplement. You don't wanna just have kids on the computer the entire time. So it needs to go along with your lesson. So technology basics, right? Because we know at the end of the day, uh, teachers don't need to be computer expert, experts. We just need to know the basics, right? <laughs> so the effective teacher to understand basic terms and concepts related to current technology. So most classrooms have uh, technology for teacher and student use and should be utilized appropriately. So when we're talking about hardware, it's a computer and the associated physical equipment directly involved with the performance of data processing or communication functions. Uh, then you have the software, which is the program, the routines or the symbolic languages that control the function of the hardware. So you got the hardware and then the software is basically the brain. Input output devices, devices that send information to and receive information from computers. Then we have the network, a system of computers that share information, right? That's why you got to be careful what you put on your uh, work computer because you are sharing a system. <laughs> File, a collection of data. Then you have memory, the storage of information in the computer. And then virus, a foreign computer program that runs against the owner's desire and typically runs one or more uh, or multiple programs, often enters uh, via email attachment. Right. So this is basically all you need to know as far as technology. This is it. Put this to memory and live your life. That's it. <laughs> um, so incorporation of technology. So teachers should work towards incorporating digital publishing and technology in the following ways. Publishing final drafts of writing or projects electronically. So this is how it, this physics, because I'm a person, I'm a teacher. I need to know, okay, how does this live in my classroom? So this is how it lives in your classroom. Pub publishing final drafts of writing or projects electronically. Working cooperatively in groups by sharing information digitally using word processes to plan, draft, and revise written work. Remember, guys, you want to stay away from programs that hinder kids from being able to edit on their own, right? Um, organizing information in spreadsheets, utilizing databases for research, right? So these are all the ways that it will live in your classroom. Technology offers an important way to extend learning beyond the classroom, but planning and forethought are key to successfully incorporating it into the classroom routine. So in a nutshell, that is competency nine. As someone who's taken this test, I have 100% passing rate with people. This is all that I show them <laughs> and they're good. So let's go through some questions. So this is the breakdown. So keep in mind, guys, um, keep in mind, I don't know what materials everybody has went through. We have people who are new and probably have went through maybe certified teacher. We have people who, you know, they've seen the test a bit. And so they might have went through the Rhea book, 240, certified teacher, um, study guides, all this stuff. So I don't know who's seen what questions. So don't look it at the lens of, OK, I've seen this question already. I'm just going to answer real quick. That's fine, you can answer real quick, but I want you to really pay attention to the rationale and look at the trends of what tends to be correct. Cause that's what's going to help you when you see a question that you've never seen before, you'll still be able to apply that same knowledge to a new question, right? So just because you've seen it before, don't just be like, okay, this is it, let me move on. No, there's a reason some people just pass the test with that little flimsy study guide because they um, have mastered the competencies, right? And that is your roadmap to passing this test. Okay, let's move on. So a middle school social studies teacher is presenting a unit on civil rights issues in the 1960s. Oh, okay. And you might have noticed I highlight a lot. You have that feature on the PPR test, right, to highlight. Use it. Highlight those keywords in the, the um, scenario, in the question, and also 
the answer choices because the, the answer is going to stick out to you a lot faster if you highlight those keywords. Okay. So a middle school social studies teacher is presenting a unit on civil rights issues in the 1960s after she pre presents several lectures and demonstrations on key civil rights events in that period. She wants to integrate technology to encourage students to explore their understanding and perceptions of the issues in a collaborative format. Hmm, collaborative. We've heard that before. Where do we see that from? The competency. Which of the following applications would most effectively address the teacher's goal? And what is the teacher's goal? To make sure that students are collaborating, right? She wants to encourage students to explore their understanding and perceptions of the issue in a collaborative format. So any one of these answer choices that do not promote collaboration, meaning working with someone else, is the wrong answer. So A, setting up a class discussion board where students are allowed to create threads. B, having students do online research to find 1960-era responses to the civil rights events of the period. C, posting electronic copies of newspaper and magazine articles on civil rights issues. D, using a spreadsheet to create a timeline of key civil rights events over the past 50 years. So I have A, I've highlighted class discussion board because I know students will be able to collaborate with a class discussion board, okay? B, how students do online research to find 1960 era responses to civil rights events. That can be powerful, but I don't see the collaboration piece. So I'm gonna move on to C. Posting electronic copies of newspaper and magazine articles on civil rights issues. Once again, the collaboration piece is not there, so I'm gonna move on. D, use a spreadsheet to create a timeline of key civil rights events over the past 50 years. No, if this spreadsheet was one where, you know, they use maybe like track changes and, you know, teachers could comment and, and not teachers, but students could comment on each other's work, then a spreadsheet might make more sense. But since that's not it, it would be A, setting up a class discussion board because they're able to collaborate. All right, so for the next question, I do want y'all to uh, participate and put your answers in, and then we'll go through. So through her membership in the National Council for the Social Studies, Ms. Vidal is able to connect with several teachers throughout the country who are doing similar projects. She arranges a video conference with one of these teachers. The teachers will give students a chance to exchange ideas and set up online communication opportunities. This activity primarily enhances student learning in which of the following ways? So this is about enhancing student learning through technology. So A, ensuring that students incorporate opinions and personal observations from a wide variety of learners into the class project. B, reducing the amount of time that students need to spend in a traditional library research. Um, C, using technology to synthesize knowledge, share information, and participate electronically in a learning community. D, expanding the class community by using resources outside the school environment. What do you guys think? I'm gonna give us about um, one more minute. But for those who need like more wait time and processing time, process is fine. So most of us said C, right? And looking at these buzzwords, synthesize knowledge, share information, participate electronically, right? That is basically the meat and potatoes of competency nine, right? These are the buzzwords that we see a lot of. So C would absolutely be the correct answer. Does anyone have any questions about why that's the right answer? Okay. So it says, Mr. Drake has 10 computer stations in the classroom, each set up with several phonics software programs that allow students to create flashcards, 
practice initial sound recognition, and spell simple words through interactive prompting. Mr. Drake groups the children, making sure that English language learner students are with native speakers. Mr. Drake has the students work together on phonics using a program that focuses on the animal kingdom. This assignment primarily addresses which of the following means of implementing effective instruction. A, using developmentally appropriate technology applications to support instructional goals. B, integrating time for play into school activities. C, integrating rest time to balance active movement time. D, using heterogeneous grouping to help students appreciate each other's differences. So if we have been learning the competencies, probably like two out of four of these um, answer choices are coming from another competency. And we could just cross those out immediately. So he has them work together on phonics using a program that focuses on the animal kingdom. This assignment primarily addresses which of the following means of implementing effective instruction. Give us about one more minute. And then just thinking about what this competency is about will really make the answer more apparent. What have we been talking about the entire time, right? Because they'll, they'll flip in some really close answers. But if we know the competency, then, you know, it really starts to, the answers really start to stand out to you. All right. So if we said A, we were absolutely correct. The phonics program offers a good technological application to do what? To support the instructor's goal for this age level. Which of the following features of word processing software primarily supports effective application of the writing process? A, the spelling and grammar check function, B, the cut and paste function, C, the thesaurus function, or D, the style set option. And sometimes the questions are very, you know, very straightforward, just like this. You either know it or you don't. <laughs> so we're talking about word processing software. And it needs to primarily support effective application of the writing process. What is the writing process? It is first being able to brainstorm what you're going to talk about. It is the drafting stage. It is the revision stage, the editing, and then the publishing stage. So which one of these would help with, you know, either one of those stages? Would the style set option be helpful? Thinking about the style of the page, the thesaurus function, would the cut and paste function be helpful? Would the spelling and grammar check function? What do we think? All right, so we got some mixed ones in here. That's okay. Okay, yeah, so I can repeat the stages. So you go from brainstorming, you know, to the drafting stage where you're just trying to put words to paper. Once you put words to paper, you go through the revision stage where you are, you know, either taking sentences, putting sentences in or taking sentences out. And then you also have the editing stage where you are looking at your capitalization, your punctuation, and then you go to your publishing where it is done and you're ready to publish. All right, guys. 
So remember what I said, you want to stay away from what? You want to stay away from spelling and grammar check functions. Those are your enemies. <laughs> Why is this your enemy? Because those functions, they're not your enemy, okay? The Grammarly has its place. It has its place. But when we're talking about kids EC through uh, 12th grade, they need to get the basics of being able to um, edit their own work first before they use spelling and grammar check functions, right? So as someone who is a writing and reading teacher, like I want them to be able to check their own work first before they start relying on Grammarly, okay? Because when Grammarly goes away, here come all these little issues. So the best, um, the best word processing software would be the cut and paste function because it's gonna help with the revision. With revision, you are taking sentences out, you're also putting them in. So using the cut and paste function. Does that make sense? So the cut and paste function allows student writers to effectively revise throughout the writing process. So A is problematic because relying on these functions keeps student writers from critically editing their work. So you wanna stay away from those uh, word processing where they're not able to uh, edit their own work. Remember, I'll be drop like I try to drop little hints before y'all actually get to the question. Y'all gotta be, you gotta be listening. You gotta be ready. Stay ready, so you don't have to get ready. All right, let me stop. Okay, let me move on. <laughs> All right, so question five. Um, a school district has implemented. And you notice now there is no highlight here. It's gone because we have to do it ourselves. I am a teacher at heart. I do, we do, you do. So now you need to do. So a school district has implemented a bring your own device policy, which allows students to use their internet capable personal devices in class with teacher permission. Teachers are planning to have students use the devices for end of chapter quizzes. Which of the following is the most appropriate way for the teachers to ensure that students who do not own personal devices can participate? So if we remember correctly, the competency talks about um, being equitable, right? That's one of the words that one of the, um, one of the people on the call actually put, right? So being equitable. A, requiring our students to answer the quizzes on paper and to submit the paper. Uh, B, providing loaner devices from school inventories that are capable of assessing the quizzes. C, asking students to share the devices with students who do not own a device. D, students about activities in advance and requiring them to borrow or rent a device. I'm sorry, there's a typo. Hold on. So if we said B, we're absolutely correct. So providing loaner devices from in school inventory, right? that will be equitable. So that means everybody will be able to um, use a, a technological device, right? That would be equitable. So if we said B, we were absolutely correct. So it provides each student with the opportunity to participate in the activity using a basic device fulfilling the original purpose of the activity. All right, so a teacher plans to use an online discussion board on which students will respond to open-ended questions about the novel they are studying. Parents are already given permission for the students to post online. Which of the following is the next step the teacher should take? So parents have already given permission for the students to post online. So what would be the next step the teacher should take? So we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. What do we think?
Absolutely. Both of us said B. So then after you get permission from the parents, it's time for you to model the types of communication that your, the students should use. So a teacher plans to integrate technology into a collaborative learning environment. Which of the following student activities will be most engaging to the students and achieve the teacher's goal? See how these questions are not too far from each other, right? I got these from two totally different sources. And at the end of the day, it's the same stuff, right? We saw a question like this that was very similar. People are lazy. It's not going to go too far from the competency. So what do we think? <laughs> Very similar question from two different re from two different resources. So if we said B, we're absolutely correct, because what a blog, a blog is a collaborative activity that requires student interaction, right? So that would absolutely be correct. So which of the following appropriately identifies the teacher's role in understanding and using technology? So what is our role here? A, effective teachers should understand basic terms and concepts related to current technology. Most classrooms have technology for teacher and student use and should be utilized appropriately. B, teachers should expect students to understand technology and don't need to be able to use the tools in the classroom. C, teachers should rely on pencil and paper and in-person communication because students are lacking in these abilities because of a reliance on technology. D, teachers should be experts on all new technology and need to be able to teach students how to use these tools. All right, so if we said A, we were absolutely correct, right? We've seen this time and time again, just understanding basic terms and concepts, that's all we needed to know. All right, nine. Mr. Harris wants to create a writing assignment that allows students to write with an authentic and meaningful purpose, right? So it needs to be uh, true and meaningful to them. Which one of the following assignments would best accomplish Mr. Harrison's goal? A, work with the social studies teacher to assign a historical fiction, writing about the historical period currently being studied by the students. Use Word to type a journal entry about summer vacation. Print the entry and have students draw a picture to go with it. C, allow students to create their own writing assignment. D, use Word to type a letter to an elected official about a student chosen need in the community. Print and send the letters. What do we think? Keywords here is authentic and meaningful purpose. That's the buzzwords here. That's the keywords. You can go ahead and put your answer in the chat. Key word here would best accomplish Mr. Harrison's goal. Authentic and meaningful purpose. So not just writing to write, but it is meaningful. Oh, I'm getting a lot of B and D, B and D. Let's see what happens. So it is D. 
So do you have the correct answer? It is okay, guys. It's fine. Like, <laughs> this is the best answer choice because it allows the student to write about a need in their community to an elected official. This activity is the best choice as it is most meaningful and authentic of all the choices, right? So key word here was student chosen need. Because they got to choose it, it would be most uh, like authentic and meaningful to them. Um, a journal entry about summer vacation, um, I can see how it would be, um, how it could be authentic, but the key word here would be student chosen, right? Um, that's why it is the most um, meaningful and authentic, right? So the buzzword you want to look for when you're talking about authentic and meaningful, uh, you want student choice in it. That's the key word, because I've seen a few questions of, with this. And a lot of times when you see student chosen or they get to pick, uh, you want to lean towards those types of answers, because um, those tend to be the correct ones. So yes, it would be D. This is our last one. So the English and Social Studies teachers at Calhoun Middle School developed an interdisciplinary instructional unit where students will create a multimedia presentation on literary work by wartime, wartime soldiers. The teachers are concerned that many students will focus on the aesthetics of the presentation and not the quality of its content. So this is what we need to focus on. So they will focus on the aesthetics of the presentation and not the quality of the content. Okay, so all the flashing lights, all the graphics, and not necessarily the message, in other words. The most effective strategy to address the concern would be to A, collaborate with the students to design a rubric of expectations upon which the students would be graded. B, allow the students to submit a rough draft of their presentation and then provide feedback on the quality of the content within the submitted presentation. C, allow students to use a limited number of pictures and graphics in their presentation. Or D, create a list of websites for students to use as resources for their research. Definitely go back and reread. So we have A, collaborate with the students to design a rubric of expectations. That's what stands out to me. Allow the students to submit a rough draft of their presentation. Provide feedback. Allow students to use li a limited number of pictures and graphics. Create a list of websites. So using what has been highlighted, go ahead and pick your answer. All right, guys, key word here, it was A, right? If, student, if students can help with creating the rubric, they will better understand the expectations of the assignment and the need to provide quality content rather than just aesthetics, right? Collaborate with the students. And we know collaborate is a what? It's a buzzword. It's definitely a word that is all up and down, competency nine. So look for those buzzwords. Don't just see a buzzword and say, hey, that's the right answer. It needs to be in context, it needs to make sense, but those are definitely the answer choices I lean towards when I see a buzzword. That's just me. All right, so we're gonna have a quick lesson on English language proficiency standards, guys. Um, very quick, I do apologize. Uh, competency nine did go over, and even then, I don't think I covered everything because it's, you know, it's an hour, but I think um, I covered it as much as I needed to for you guys to be okay. Um, so with English language proficiency standards, specifically in writing, I'm just going to leave y'all with just a few quick hits. When you're looking at beginning writing, guys, because every year I have to grade tell pass, and this is what we do. <laughs> we give ratings, beginning, intermediate, advanced, and advanced high. Lord have mercy. This is every day. So with beginning, okay? A lot of the time, the writing is not like 
understandable, right? The student may go from English to their native language. You see a lot of listing, a lot of copying, a lot of pasting, okay? Um, so anytime you see uh, writing where, you know, they jump from English to their native language and it's, you know, it's really hard for you to make out, like really, really hard for you to understand, it's beginning, okay? Intermediate. They write in present tense, short, simple sentences, okay? Remember that for intermediate, short, simple sentences. Many spelling errors, a lot of spelling errors. Um, and then when it's time to write in detail, they struggle with writing in detail. That's why it's very short. And when in, it's important to read the writing aloud, even in testing, right? Read it aloud to yourself because intermediate comes off very choppy because it's short in, in simple sentences, right? And it's not a lot of detail, especially when they start um, asking for like content specific writing, they might start to repeat themselves again and again because they just don't have the vocabulary yet, okay? And it may be hard to read unless you're familiar with reading English language learner writing. Um, with advanced, um, they use basic and occasionally more complex verbs, grammar, and sentence patterns. What do we mean by sentence patterns? So with intermediate, we know the sentences are simple. With advanced, com you'll see more compound sentences. I went to the store and I bought bread and I bought candy, things of that nature. And then when they start talking about like content specific, so if you have, if they have to write about math or they have to write about science, they're able to use more advanced verbs, right? And the writing samples are longer. Advanced, oh, and um, you know, they still do need additional support. You might find that, um, you know, the spelling, the spelling errors are, are still very much apparent, right? Um, advanced high, very, very, very few errors, okay? It's comparable to native speakers um, for their grade level. Remember to look at their grade level because you might read something and you're like, oh my God, this is intermediate. But then you realize you're reading a second grade writing. And then it becomes advanced high because this is what second grade writing looks like, right? So you want to remember to look at the grade level. That's going to make all the difference. Is this advanced high for second grade? Is this advanced high for fourth grade, right? Because this is if this is what fourth graders typically write like, then it goes from intermediate to advanced high. So you want to make sure you look at the grade level. I hope I'm making sense. Let me know. All right. So we're going to do, well, let me see. So we don't have a lot, a lot of time. Let's see what we can do here. So I am going to put the Quizlet cards that I tend to use that help me study. Um, let's see. And I'm just about to drop the link in really quickly. So the link is in the chat. So for beginning writing, right? Because you're, they're going to probably give you some writing samples, right? For beginning writing, you want to remember it's little to no ability to express ideas. They lack English necessary to de demonstrate great appropriate writing. They might label, list, and copy. Um, they use a lot of high frequency words, and, to, but um, there's a lot of present tense errors in language. Intermediate writing, as I mentioned before, simple, short, original sentences, a lot of high frequency vocab, present tense. There's difficulty with expressing abstract ideas. Advanced writing, use English with some support, able to develop elements of grade appropriate material, basic grammar and sentence structure, 
okay? Basically understood by all. And then we have advanced high writing, okay? Comparable to native English speakers. These Quizlet cards are great because it goes through the writing, the listening, um, and the speaking. And the great part about it um, with speaking is very similar to writing, in my opinion. So with beginning, speak in single words, short phrases, highly practiced, very limited vocabulary. It goes hand in hand with the writing, right? So that's just a quick way to kind of remember. With intermediate speaking, express what? Simple, original messages, hesitate frequently, speak simply, rarely have vocabulary to speak in detail. That should sound familiar to how it is with the writing, right? Same thing. Advanced speaking, participate comfortably in conversation, academic discussion, some pauses, repetition, discuss familiar academic uh, topics with content-based vocab. And then advanced high speaking, participate in extended discussions comfortably and grade appropriately, communicate effectively using abstract and content-based vocab, use many of the same colloquialisms as native English speaking peers, complex sentences compar comparable to peers, same thing with the writing, right? So if I were you, I would definitely go through that. Those Quizlet cards, they were very, very, very helpful. I also have, um, some questions. I'm going to make sure that I upload the PowerPoint, so you should be good to go. But I think I gave you a basis to it. Um, I will do another one where um, I go over it a little bit more in detail, but we have run out of time. All right, guys. So this is the last thing that I'm going to leave you with before we head on out. Um, All right, so if you want me to, I, I can upload it to the page, but if you want me to directly send it, send it to you, those who participated um, in today's session, I will definitely just like send it to your email. Um, here's another thing that I want to let you know that I am doing. Um, so uh, for those who are asking about um, study guides and things. I get emails all the time about it. So that's why I am uh, presenting it here. Um, I have it where uh, I have a Google Classroom. It has study guides, PowerPoints, videos, access to previously recorded sessions, access to rigorous questions, access to resources. Um, you will also have access to three group sessions that will cover Bloom's taxonomy, English language proficiency standards in detail, as well as competency seven and eight. And you'll also get a one 30 minute check in with me. Um, you would get all of that for um, 150. So if you are interested, and people know my prices are super high, but I do do a discounted rate for the people that come to my free seminars. Um, that is something that you definitely can take advantage of. Um, other than that, you guys have been great. I'm going to send this PowerPoint to you. Uh, I'm also going to send you the recording. Just give me about a day to have it uploaded. <laughs> and then we should be good to go. Um, so y'all have a good rest of your day. Just send me your email if you want me to directly send you the PowerPoint. I'm going to upload it to the group page. But if you want it directly sent to you, just send me your email and I'll directly send it to you. All right, guys, that's all I have. Y'all have been great. Have a good rest of your night. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Have a great week. See y'all later. You're welcome. You're welcome. Y'all are great. <laughs> oh.